Hi. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, thanks. I've been uh, very productive, it feels, so I feel really good about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, getting started with the interview, what was life like growing up and why did you get into photography in particular? Why? What was life like growing up? Um, these are big questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I, so, I was born in Birmingham. I grew up, um, my parents had a shop. Pretty much, so we, I was born in Handsworth, then when I was about a year and a half old, we moved to where my parents still live now in Bearwood. And um, yeah, so I was kind of raised in a, in a corner shop, news agents, um, and yeah, just working, very working class family. My parents migrated to Birmingham when, uh, in the 70s, so they migrated here and kind of worked really hard to make life here. Um, how I got into photography was I did... Um, degree in communication culture and media and my second year um I picked up a module called uh what which was photography essentially and um yeah and then it just went from there it just ended up being something I I, I was always artistic at school but then I didn't take it further after after school like I did art and music and whatnot but then when I got to uni and got the chance to do photography I didn't realize how much I would love it, but I kind of, I just did. And it became like what I did for the rest of my degree um, as far as possible. And then, yeah, carried on doing it after. Nice. So I feel like a lot of your photography is quite socially engaged. So like with community or what's going on in society, how important is that to you? Yeah, I think it's central to my practice. Um, it's massively important to me and the one thing I've reflected on in the last few years is well how can I do something about all these social issues which really trouble me and really upset me um trouble upset and kind of in some ways really make me angry um but then what I've found diff well especially when we had 2020 and um everything that happened with the pandemic and then everything that happened with the uh, what happened to George Floyd and the way he was murdered I just thought this anger is going to consume me what can I do about it um and so to kind of avoid that kind of anger or just feeling angry and that's how I pursue it in my work I channel it into something I feel is positive that I can give back to the community the people I'm around um who I work with yeah, and trying to help make a more positive contribution to society um, compared to, the, I guess, the things that we see on a daily basis, which yeah, are, are really upsetting. Yeah, because that's what I've noticed about it. It's a lot about sport as well. And like, how does that reflect the positivity that you're trying to show? Yeah, so the pos well, with sport, I grew up playing sport. So that's my I have a huge passion in sport because I, I played football when I was young. I'd play anything, actually. Netball, football round, as you name it, I'd play it. Um, but I really love football. Um, so that's, from the very beginning, been in my work. Um, so I did work on women's football. And then when I heard about the Commonwealth Games, um, being in Birmingham, hometown, I thought I've got to do a project on it. And I kind of built on it from there. And then I think just the way I like talking to people <laughs> and and but getting to find out who they are and what makes them tick and so the kind of things that we spoke about when I made people place in sport were really relevant like the, relevant to how people were feeling at the time and then sport is the thing that tied all the work together I guess for this particular project um and yeah I think photography is beautiful in that it's given me the opportunity to meet people and have these really rich conversations that I think on a normal daily basis, you probably don't, possibly like your job as well, I guess you get to meet people and chat about really interesting things. Definitely, yeah. Like choosing the subjects as well for the, the portraits, how did you go about doing that? Um, I got in touch with local community clubs. So it was because the project's very much about grassroots sports, um, I wanted to look at community clubs, which have a really strong impact in their local, where they based. Um, and it was also trying to get a range of sports. So with my work, I was trying to represent different ethnicities and ages and genders. Um, so that was also playing on my mind, okay, what clubs should I approach? 
um, that represent those different elements. But then there's also the aspect of things which are significant around Birmingham and Sandwell. So like Bourneville Bowls. Um, I hadn't photographed many uh, older people that played sports at this point. So I was looking for that as a something that I was missing in the project. Um, and then also Bourneville being the Bourneville Bowls Club, a part of the Bourneville Trust, which is associated with Cadbury, which is such a important historical, I guess, company that played such a strong impact socially for people of Birmingham. Um, so I wanted to also look at those factors too. Yeah, so how involved were the people that you were then like taking pictures of? Because, you, you know, you'd heard a lot about them. Like, did you go into like great conversations with them or was it quite a quick process? Um, yeah, they were really involved. So the places that I photographed them, they'd chosen. It was tended to be where they played sport, practiced or trained. And then the conversations, I actually had a couple of assistants with me who, whilst I was shooting the portraits, I'd chat to everybody who was photographing, but they would then record the interviews with them. Ah, so, okay. yeah, they'd have a good 20 minute, half an hour chat. I think the younger people were a bit more quiet, so they probably didn't say as much. But um, I think that's just maybe confidence more than anything. But actually, some young people were brilliant that we photographed as well that did have really great things to say. So, yeah, the interviews are quite integral to the work as well because it's about amplifying their voices um so yeah it couldn't happen without that yeah and as well like I feel like when I was looking at the portraits because I went to the St Paul's um square it taught me about the portraits is everyone seems quite powerful in their stance but in very different ways I think was that something that you consciously made them do or were they very much in control of how they wanted to portray themselves yeah, I think it was, I don't tend to pose people. I like them to feel natural, but I guess the framing of it is something I consider. Where's the best light? Where's the best composition? But then it is about, well, how can I get the best out of this person? And you have often very quick turnaround time or short span of time to spend with each person. So how can I do this quickly? And most often than not, it's making them feel comfortable in front of the camera because also a lot of these uh, a lot of the people I was photographing they're not used to this they're, they're not used to having the photograph taken in this manner um so it wasn't like it was an action shot it was very much about the individual and that's just about getting the best out of them I find is to just give them lots of attention and value um and listen to them what have they got to say and so they've start to kind of drop their guard a bit and feel comfortable in the area I might have um I might give them a little bit of direction in terms of where I might want them to face in regards to the light or maybe move shuffle this way a little bit just to get the composition right. But yeah, body posture and body language is very much, um, I don't direct in that way. I like them to feel confident. Yeah. And as well, like the you mentioned like how you did like the light and stuff. I think it was the boxing one where the background the purpley sort of background was gorgeous like was that just how it looked or did you intentionally want that like powerful background um the, it's interesting because that mma is fearless but where uh, where they train that cage is actually in the sky so they've got a gym underneath and then it's like this floating cage so um where they train all their fighters and whatnot so when as soon as I got into the space, it was really dynamic. That's just how the space was. The colours were just popping out. And then also it was one of those shoots where I walked in and you could just smell the sweat. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm in a boxing gym. You can really feel the atmosphere. So, um, and I think Amelia's portrait, it just, it made itself because of what she was wearing as well. The fearless kind of the, the shorts she's wearing. I think then I just needed to try and capture the best of her in the best light and best position. But it was really well set up for me, to be honest, by, by chance. But they had these beautiful skylights as well. And the sun kind of kept coming and going. So we've, we've shot in the evening. Oh, nice. That's gorgeous. Well, it's so accessible. Like anyone just walking past could turn in and just go, like, oh, the, those portraits. How important was it that it was accessible and everyone can really see it? Yeah, I think that hits the nail on the head. The reason why 
um, we didn't want it indoors was because who accesses art um, in galleries um, and making it more accessible. So the work more accessible to anyone in, in these public spaces, we, the places we picked. So there's eight exhibitions on at the moment and all of those are back in the community spaces where the photographs were taken. So St Paul Square, for instance, is around the corner from the Hockley gym I photographed some of the MMA fighters. And then uh, Birmingham Coach Station is around the corner from where the Women's Boxing Club is in Digbeth. So in the Bourneville Bowls, there's an exhibition there on the green, again, for where the club is. So um, accessibility is key. It's so paramount because also a lot of these community communities may not go into those white wall galleries, which can sometimes be really intimidating spaces. Um, so this is kind of access for all. And for instance, my parents would never really go to an art gallery unless like I had work on show and I took them with me. <laughs> it's not usually a space that they would go in themselves naturally, but they would go to the park or they would walk through a town centre or they would go to these kind of spaces. So that was really key in the way we were thinking about where to sh show the work. Definitely. And so it was the portraits in the park and then on your website, I saw the sort of empty spaces. So it was sort of like left over from the pandemic. So like the empty gyms and things like that. Could you talk me through doing like showing so much activity and vibrance within the portraits, but then having that emptiness in like the actual spaces? Yeah, that um, so part of uh, part of my development, I guess, is um, in my own photographic development. I wanted to usually I shoot portraits, but I wanted to try and see if I could also capture the spaces and sporting hubs where sports takes place but the I wanted to contrast to what we're going to see on the tv during the Commonwealth Games where we're going to see this really shiny new stadium like Alexandra Stadium now they've re renovated it for the games and it looks beautiful but on a weekly basis that's not the kind of thing we tend to see <laughs> that go and play sports so it was part of trying to capture that. So it was a bit of a personal challenge to myself. Can I do this? Can I shoot in shoot details and landscapes, which I don't normally do, but then also to try and explore these empty spaces, like you said. But what I really liked as well was there was a real contrast when I was shooting the project of this lots of conversations, um, rich conversations happening when I was shooting the portraits, but then this real solitude where I could uh, shoot the landscapes, but I was on my own. And in these spaces, and a lot of them were empty because of lockdown, people were still coming out of lockdown. And so this time last year, like the Smedic swimming baths was still not open to the public when they gave me access to it, um, to photograph. And so it felt really odd that I was in these spaces, which usually would be teeming with people, but they were completely devoid of people. And I kind of got the chance to just think about the work um, whilst also being in these spaces. And at the time as well, last year, I was working with a women's refuge um, at Birmingham Crisis Centre. And so a lot of what, it, it was a project that ended up crossing over, which wasn't meant to, but because of the pandemic kind of got delayed, I me mean, working with the women at the refuge. And um, it ended up being a really nice headspace for me to shoot those landscapes because of what I was hearing and what I was working on with the women at the refuge. Um, it gave me that space to kind of think about, well, actually, how do we treat other people? How do we treat our environment um, as well? And the marks we make physically and emotionally in an environment. So that all kind of creeped into it as well. Especially it's very hard to have that sort of quiet space. Now we're out of lockdown again. I think it's very hard to find that quiet. And going back to one of your previous like photography series, um, the ones where you were shooting people and where they wanted to be and what represented them in lockdown as well. Could you talk me through that project a little bit? Yeah, so Birmingham Lockdown Stories was, like I mentioned to you previously, when I was, um, when we went through 2020's lockdown and I was feeling really, I didn't know where to put myself, like in terms of feeling all this, what we'd all been through. And the commission came about, well, I had experienced lockdown, but like on the street I live on, um, when we were slowly easing out of lockdown, and do you remember we had that VE party? But I was really fortunate. Like I met so many of my neighbours, and um, there was a good sense of neighbourliness, but I knew loads of people, other people hadn't had that. 
And so that was part of what inspired the Lockdown Stories project, that I wanted to capture people's stories, essentially, of their experiences in lockdown. Um, and an important element of that was to spend, like, ask them, well, actually, what, what space and what place really sums it up for you? And so, yeah, so that collaborative portrait kind of, they initiated, well, I'd like to be photographed here. Um, so whether that was Mosley Bog or Hotlands Hospital, um, Sutton Park, that, or I think I photographed my next door neighbours and um, they chose their garden, um, for instance. So, yeah, so that was how it kind of began. And since then, actually, it's been amazing, like where, where that project's gone. Um, so the portrait of Dr. Mavi, I've actually got the book here because I'm uh, I'm working on the people, place and sport, making that into a book. So oh, I started amazing. actually doing it today, this morning. And I was looking through this. And so this portrait got into, um, it won the Portrait of Britain Award. Oh, wow, well the, done. Thank you, at, with British Journal of Photography. Um, but then Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery also acquired 12 of the portraits um, for their permanent collection. So three of them are on show at the moment at um, Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, which obviously just reopened this weekend, gone. Yeah, which is pretty major for me, like because the, they've what they've said as well is it goes down as kind of a bit of, well, quite a major part of social history. Yeah. These stories for the pandemic of what we experienced. Like, has your work changed since the pandemic because it seems more people want to talk to you like I don't know if I've, I feel like I've noticed it myself I've been having more conversations with strangers just out and about and has that nature of your work changed or has it always been like that somewhat I think to some degree it's always been like that I've always made uh, to some degree uh, collaborative portraits looking at people in places um, I think what I've got better at is recording the stories. Um, I think definitely in the last five years, so probably prior to the pandemic, that recording of the text or the audio, those conversations and how I use them has improved. So yeah, so I think I've always worked that way or similar, but I've got better at um, making sure that's more part of the work. Um, yeah. No, it's good that People, Place and Sport is becoming a book as well. I think that's really exciting. So that's like the main project you've got going on. Is there any other photography projects that you see yourself doing in the future? Yeah, the work I want to go back and do is work um, at some point is with the Women's Refuge again. So I, I did two, about two years of working with them. Actually, it, was, it coincided with when I got the commission for the Lockdown Stories project. Um, I didn't expect to get that commission. So I started volunteering at the Women's Refuge because of what I was saying to you earlier, because I just thought I need to do something good. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing something good because everything around me just seems like utter chaos. And and then, but then it ended up being, I ended up getting some funding to work more with the women at the refuge. Um, and that's something I want to go back and work on again. So we made a zine as part of that project with the women at the refuge. They shot on disposable cameras we combined their stories with them um, um, with the images they shot but I just don't feel like I'm done with that yet so that I feel like I want to go back and do more on but I'm not sure in what capacity yet um, so yeah, there's that and then I'm working with uh, so through the people place and sport project because it's part of the Birmingham 2022 festival the BBC have commissioned me to make a film a short film um, yeah, so that's, and that's very much outside my comfort zone because I've just do still images usually. So the, um, that film at the moment we're working on and it's a short film they've commissioned me to make and it's kind of, it's going to be on the journey of an individual, but through grassroots sports. So the way we film it and whatnot. So it's definitely still going to be that celebration of local people and grassroots sports, but that also that strength of character and grit and resilience we have or have had to have um over the last couple of years so that's the yeah that that one I'm obviously working on the book and then the film um and that's all I've got planned right now <laughs> <laughs> that still sounds really busy and as well like I wanted to briefly touch on the Commonwealth Games as well I think yeah. it's such an odd one because one it is bringing people to Birmingham and it's 
forcing investment into Birmingham, but also the Commonwealth itself. I mean, I don't particularly agree with it. Um, and how do you feel about sort of the Commonwealth Games and cap like ca capturing the Commonwealth Games essentially? Yeah, I'd agree with you. I think there's it's a bit of a double-edged sword that um, I don't agree with what the Commonwealth stands for um, and the history of its links to colonialism, imperialism and empire and everything that that has in, entailed in the past. Um, but what I'm seeing from the, what the festival's doing um, or the games, everything, all of it, is there is this big investment in Birmingham and when the arts especially have been so badly hit and freelancers have been so badly hit over the last couple of years what's really nice to see is the amount of money and support and funding going into uh, local communities and local arts organizations to make work but what's also really interesting is um, the festival haven't shied away from going okay we know that people feel um, uncomfortable with the Commonwealth Games but let's make some work on it and so there's people that are getting funding from the games but they're making work that is talking about the issues to do with Commonwealth the issues to do with colonialism so I'm really happy that the festival are doing that um, because if they would tried to glaze over it I think that would have made it worse in a way um, yeah so it's one of those it's it's brilliant to see the investment coming in and also the other thing that's really hard as well is if you don't participate in these kind of festivals or like for instance if I didn't take this opportunity to make this work I wouldn't have got this commission from the BBC to make this film and for someone that's an individual kind of visual artist it's a massive platform for me to show my work which I wanted to take as an opportunity to do something positive with so like you said celebrating local people and seeing them in outdoor spaces and that's been an opportunity to do something positive from what is essentially, I feel like the Commonwealth Games is quite archaic and, and a really old concept, but um, yeah. But then as well with the sports people, like for them, no matter how they feel about what the Commonwealth represents, it's a massive opportunity for those sports to get those sport athletes, I mean, um, to get medals and achieve great things themselves in the sports. And for us as well to see such a massive, like I'm a big sports fan, so I've got so many tickets to so many of the games. Um, for us to see world-class athletes on our doorstep is pretty um, pretty incredible as well, because otherwise it's not usually an opportunity we get. Yeah, so it's really complex, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, there's one more exhibition that we're going to install, which will be around the game's time which will be at Sandor Valley Park. So that will be a combination of the landscapes and the portraits, but it'll be larger scale. They'll be on scaffolding. Oh, wow. And yeah, so it's um, on, so that would be from July to the end of August, but because it's so big and we could only put it up temporarily over the games period. Um, yeah, so I've, I've still got like lots of those. That's gonna take up my time. I'll be doing a couple of events with those things. But otherwise, yeah, I just want to enjoy all the arts and sports that's going to happen over the summer around here. But yeah, there's so much going on, so much good stuff. Like Hugh Locke's going to have amazing work on. Um, Fierce Festival are doing some uh, um, a project around the key. I don't know if you've seen it or heard of it. Um, so they're giving people the keys to the city. So ah. usually places that aren't accessible to nor normal people, I say. Um, they're like privileged people that... I don't know, have got, um, I don't know what the right terminology is, but they they usually get keys to all these inaccessible places. They're going to get keys to the city, which anyone can get, um, and kind of go into all these places which you never usually see. Um, That's brilliant. Yeah, so there's loads of really interesting stuff like that that's happening. Wow, fantastic. Well, it was great speaking to you this morning. I hope you have a more productive day getting your book done. It's, it's exciting. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Shona. I really appreciate um, that you went to see the work and this conversation is brilliant. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. I've enjoyed both. All, All right. right. Fantastic. Have a lovely rest of the day. I'll you catch you later. Bye. Bye.